and welcome to another episode of Around the Verse. I'm Sandy Gardner. And I'm Chris Roberts. This week, we're excited to bring you a special feature on Squadron 42. Yes, yeah, so back in our holiday show, we showed the vertical slice and a first look at the coil, a menacing mass of planet fragments and static electrical storms. It's a very unique environment that posed some distinct technical design challenges. Yes, this month we're only taking a closer look at the coil since our teams just recently got back from the holidays. But going forward, our monthly updates for Star Citizen and Squadron 42 will include detailed project reports along with one or two features. Let's check in with the devs now on the coil. What is the coil? Um, it's a huge volumetric thing out in space. Um, it's a thing that you have to be able to fly outside to look at. It's a thing you have to fly inside to be to be surrounded by. Um, I think you fly through through bits of it. Um, it's a technical nightmare. Um, it's all it's all manner of things. The coil was was sort of a, a fun. Uh, element in Squadron 42 because it was basically this sort of, it, it plays a big role in sort of the, the character of the system that it's in. So the story being that in Odin's system, uh, I think it was actually by the time, by the time that the UEE had discovered it, uh, the star had already gone nova. And so in the, in the sort of the blast, it decimated the first planet and for whatever reason, it created this sort of like perpetual um, I say electromagnetic because that's the first adjective that pops in my head, but sort of electrical storm of, you know, chunks of, of planetary fragments and, uh, you know, just gas and energy and all those sorts of very weird things. And so it created this sort of, um, you know, perpetual labyrinthine storm. So the idea being that there are these sort of tunnels that you can fly through it that you can safely navigate, but if you hit sort of what we call the walls, but they're not really physical, uh, the walls of the coil, it's, it will overcharge your ship basically and fry you to death. Uh, and so it, it created this interesting dichotomy of, of um, with these planetary fragments, a lot of really cool stuff that you would normally not be able to mine, like being able to actually mine the core of a planet and and stuff like that. And so it, it created a kind of unique opportunity for um, more risk, risky mining consortiums to basically like take the plunge and, and you know, travel inside the coil to try and get access to this sort of the, the potential vast resources that could be in there. Um, but it was extremely dangerous and the sort of the walls, like I said, of, of the coil shift. So theoretically where you're mining could seal up and you could be trapped in there. Um, but the danger of it also was really appealing to sort of the criminal element who uh, knew that sort of the, the cops basically would be too scared to try and follow them in there. So they would use the coil as, as basically a, a, a den to hide out in and launch raids and then come back in, you know that people probably wouldn't follow them in there. So that was sort of the original guys of it and so uh so yeah it became a big part of the squadron 42 story of creating this environment that the, the player has to kind of nav deal with uh while sifting through this story if you build in any kind of conventional game environment you've you've always got clear direction or you've got clear reference you know oh i want a mountainscape in there or oh i want my base or pirate outpost to look a certain way but when you're building something this abstract the the concept and the idea it can go through a lot of iteration and that's where we've come from there. But what we're looking at now is that exploded planet feel. So when you when you see it for the first time in the system, you should be able to see the kind of the big chunks of planet in there. You should be able to almost backwards engineer it in your own mind about where this where this idea has come from. On the outside and the intro to the game, everything's kind of peaceful, um, a little bit tense and mysterious. You're getting kind of like really kind of wispy edges and things like this. Um, but as soon as you start to kind of like um, probe its depths a bit more, um, kind of like rooting kind of mysteries out and things like that, you start to get um, kind of like more violent, it's closing in on you, getting more claustrophobic and kind of it doesn't want you there, it's pushing you away and things like that. Um, that kind of like lends itself really well to storytelling um, just through the environment itself. Traditionally in a lot of level design you'll have these really big recognizable forms that you can kind of see from any direction, um, just kind of keep you grounded in the world and know where you're going. And when you're working with a big cloud, that kind of thing gets really difficult. 
Um, so art sculpted these these big bold shapes and things like that, um, and we started kind of like recognizing them, things like that. I think internally we started naming some of them, and we had like um, the claw and the horn and all this kind of stuff, um, or named after the devs. There's not many games that can render as 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 far as we can. Uh, we call it zero render distance, so there, there is no kind of boundary. Uh, it, it's yeah, it, if you think about kind of floating through the clouds in a plane, um, it's pretty much that on 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 a huge scale. Uh, it needs to to do several things for gameplay, for design, um, and obviously for, for Chris's expectations as well on the visuals. Volumetrics in 3D software, hardware, generally are very difficult to achieve. Even offline rendering, if you start to enable sort of fog or clouds or, or anything like that, it, it becomes a hugely memory intensive. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge to do this stuff real time and to be able to kind of fly around it. The trouble is because this is a volume, it's not even this, it's not even like having a really large 3D object. It's like if you did it in a naive way, you would actually need the full, like a voxel for every square kilometer or cubic kilometer, I should say. Um, so yeah, any any time you try and turn up the resolution on it a little bit, suddenly it costs eight times as much memory. It's gone back and forth through a few different sort of technological approaches. Um, for a while we were very focused on getting very very hard walls um, at the cost of um, at the cost of the fluffiness so we were going to be able to have some softness but it was going to be a very clear distinction between like hazy stuff and rock solid stuff um, and that worked for some of the interior scenes but um, it was also we we hadn't really wired it up to um, to any third party tools so it was a very limiting experience for the artists and they didn't have a quick way of iterating on it so it, it, that didn't work out quite so well. Um, since then we've switched to a format called OpenVDB that's, um, I think it was developed by DreamWorks originally for doing foggy type stuff but conveniently that's, that's quite a common output format from a lot of third party tools so it, it kind of lets the, lets the art teams chop and change between exactly how they want to get the asset to the engine and then, then we just have to pick it up um, and convert it into our own format internally. When we started doing the coil, uh, we started by using fume effects uh, to simulate these large uh, cloud volumes. Um, but we quickly found out that uh, doing this using fume effects would take a long time to iterate upon and that the results we would get would vary dr drastically between each setting that we changed. Um, we felt that this would be a, a bad m method to actually iter iterate upon in the future. Uh, so we started using Houdini. So in Houdini, we started with this large uh, source object here, which the environment art uh, gave us. Um, we converted it to a, a volume and cut shapes through it. Um, and we can see that by looking at how it is as a 2D representation of the volume. Um, and so the whole process basically allows us to take this uh, step by step and iterate upon what we've made very uh, gently and uh, very non-destructively. Um, and by applying different noise to the various stages we can create lots more interesting shapes that you see. We're also able to merge two different uh, graphs together. So we have the main graph which is the large dominant shapes and then this uh, subtle shell that we put on in the which we mix together uh, to create a more interesting uh, coil. So this is the shell we're seeing. Uh, we also have this uh, haze, which is the gentle stuff which you fly through and um, picks up the light. And then we mix it together um, and resample it to create better quality at the end. And this allows us to have the final version uh, of, the, of the coil. You can see here that the uh, different colors represent the different density that we're seeing of this shape.
In Engine, you can see that we can import the whole coil form as the VDB grid straight into uh, the viewport. And this allows us to do uh, lots of editing inside of the engine in context. So we can change the color parameters and also how the lighting is affected. And we can also reduce or increase the density. And this allows us to create lots of different effects throughout the whole game. We're treating the coil really as a, as a, as a character um, throughout the arc of, of Squadron. So much like during a film's production, you can, you can generally kind of get a story kind of color arc from it. So um, many films, and you know, there's many websites out there that break this stuff down. You, know, you, can, you can break down a film's timeline to certain colors. Um, it's done to kind of complement what's going on in the script. Um, the coil generally kind of will be doing that as well. So obviously it's dynamic um, during the course of, of the game. Um, it can go from being kind of soft, wispy, kind of calming to look at, which generally is a help uh, more than a hindrance. Um, but also then during the arc it can get aggressive, dense, stormy. It's going to react dynamically to the sun. Um, obviously that's the most powerful light source that, that we can possibly have in the system. Um, so it needs to shade well with that, but then also you've got several kind of events that go on inside the coil at different locations. So they could be plasma storms, they could be lightning storms, they could just be you just want to overarching and kind of rim light certain things um, using this technology. So on the forefront of it, we can do all that with our eyes closed, which is general geometry. So like the ships and the space stations and all the planets and stuff, the lighting system is very much kind of catered to that. But when you go from something that is that scale to something that is absolutely huge, um, there is a degree of you know, um, new, te you know, new technology that needs to be written for that. There was new kind of gas cloud light, light entities that came in. They in turn have their own kind of noise functions. So we can hint at kind of flickering, kind of like pulsating storms in the distance. Um, this in turn then gives us just a great tool for composition, right? Um, so if we want to hint at you know danger in the distance that you don't want to go there, you're generally going to use a light source for that. It was you know another undertaking and another kind of degree of understanding on not only the tools side but also the production side. Because when I started using it, um, I was obviously kind of so defaulted back into like your old figures of of light intensities. So if you were to light say a room, you're going to have a light intensity maybe between 0.5 to 5, right? If you go up to like a Bengal hangar, for example, you've got some light intensities running into, you know, 100, 150, which is almost like a football stadium in intensity. When you go into, you know, lighting a coil, if you wanted to light a distance, thing, you're going into, you know, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000. So that sense of scale and adjusting to that is, 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 is kind of mind warping when, you, when you're doing it at points. Once you've got that in place, then you've got this beautiful luxury of, okay, you put a station next to this kind of cloud, you light that cloud up. Instead of just having this bleach sunlight coming through all the time and just this black on the other side, you can bounce that light off and then you get nice three-point lighting on these assets, which is, is you know, key um, in, in my opinion of, of, of not, that's just that black that you see all the time. It's something we always struggle with is to make interest in space environments because when you're in an FPS location and you're trying to build an environment around a specific location on a planet, it's quite easy to say, let's have a hero mountain or let's make something quite unique in this area. But when you're in space, okay, how can we do that? We've got asteroids, we've got you know planets, but how do we fill that void? And this was a big answer to that, I think. It was a way that we could bring a cinematic experience to the campaign and a real centerpiece for the campaign as well. Um, so you're not just flying around in an empty void. We're always kind of talking about these, these kind of veins running through the coil and tunnels that, that will help with general kind of navigation throughout the game. Um, so if you, if you do fly into a volume that you, know, that you can't really see far in front of, just prepare for the unexpected. Um, it also gives us the luxury of you know, potential Easter eggs here and there and, and whatnot, which is kind of nice from a design point of view. 
Um, but generally, it's it's not advised to go in. Um, there is going to be systems fed into the flight model um, that will kind of complement everything that's going on with this. So should you fly into a, a risky area, there will be a degree of turbulence that starts to vibrate your cockpit. Uh, instrumentation panels will start to malfunction. Um, generally, it, it will it will be it will go far much further than just visuals, right? So it needs to feel like you're 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 in a, a place that you're not supposed to be, uh, and that is it, that is being fed into a lot of the missions um, as well. So at times potentially you may need to be forced out from the cockpit and and go it alone, um, which is a very kind of powerful tool to have at your disposal from from a game scripting point of view. We've taken some good steps towards that doing this demo, um, but obviously there's a lot more to come. So that's going to be our challenge, is making the content look good, but making it flexible enough for the different departments to do what they want with, both from like an art direction point of view to say, I want it to look like a certain way, and then also from a design point of view to say, I want it to play a certain way. And then also from a VFX point of view, because those guys like Caleb and Oliver have been really heavily involved in the look and feel of it as well. So they need their opportunity to go in there and to make it look the way that they expect it to look as well and to, to kind of come off art direction and visual direction as well. Because it might be a case of, OK, this looks great, but can we increase the noise or can we increase the density in a certain area? If we were creating a planet side location, we would expect a certain amount of flexibility in that location. It might be the flexibility to say, I want to put my pirate base here and then I want to be able to place a mountain in the background and then maybe sculpt some of the local terrain. I think ideally, from an environment point of view, we want the same level of flexibility with this system as we would expect with other game systems. Now, because we're dealing with volumetrics, it's going to be more difficult. And because we're dealing with new technology, it's going to be more difficult. But that's what we're going to ask for ultimately, is that flexibility in the engine. Because it gives us so much more power from both, not from our department, from an art point of view, but from designers and, and everyone else who can have that flexibility in the engine then. The key issue for, for, for us to get on top of really is the memory stuff, um, which Ben will probably talk a lot more of, um, which, which will be quite, quite an in-depth talk, I imagine. The tech at the moment is it's functional, but it uses, it's very memory hungry compared to what we would want to ship. Um, I'd say, I'd say we probably want it to run in about 10% of the memory that it currently costs. We want to absolutely confirm that the things that we're, the things that we've achieved with the current tech is exactly how we want it to look, like completely nail down the look of it. And then once we've nailed down the look of it, we can go back and say, where are we where are we wasting memory where are we wasting performance we need more debug tools in engine really so we can take a slice through it for instance and just find out where's it spending memory and is it getting any benefit for the memory it's spending there like being able to sort of work out whether the asset has a bunch of areas that it's spending memory that it doesn't need or if it's something in our compile process that is wasting that memory um, that might also involve sort of switching the formats around and stuff so that it can it can analyze what the artists have put in and it'll say, for instance, they've put some very crinkly detail in and some very wispy detail. And rather than just trying to store everything at really high res so that you can have the crinkly detail to sort of, I don't know, maybe separate, separate out the wispy stuff from the crinkly stuff and store them into parallel formats or something like that. And the other thing actually that it doesn't do yet is um, things receiving shadows from the coil. Um, that's a, that's a thing where we kind of need to be absolutely certain of the tech that we're doing for now because once you have to cast shadows onto other stuff, you're looking at um, other systems for yeah other parts of the engine would then have to start receiving stuff from the coil to say, yes, there's a shadow here. So we don't want to have to update all of them every time we change the coil. That That is a challenge because it has to talk to a load of other systems, but at the same time, it's it's quite similar to how we have to do atmospheric scattering. So I'm kind of assuming that we're going to be able to kind of like thread into, like generalize the path that the, that the um, atmospheric scattering's using and sort of talk to, talk to the system through the same hole, basically. By switching to a hierarchical format, it just means if there's a big empty hole in the middle of it, or there's an area where it's fairly smooth data, then we just don't have to spend that much memory on it. It also means that 
So we, we kind of ray march through it for each pixel. So anytime you're going past something that actually knows up front that it's low res, it doesn't have to do as many samples as it passes through that area. That's what we've currently got in terms of runtime performance. Um, we're also looking at doing things like, um, because it's quite fluffy, you possibly don't need to be running it at like one ray for every pixel. Like you could run, you could run it at half or quarter res, and then after you've done it, work out which pixels don't match up with that very well, and like throw throw some extra rays at the bits that need that need fixing up afterwards, rather than just sort of brute forcing your way through the entire thing. So um, overall, like if you a lot a lot of space games um, generally, and you know our game up to to this point really has been you jump from point A to B. So if you wanted to get from planet A to planet B, for example, you're just going to go into orbit and take a jump. That's okay for the most part, but. For a story, a heavy story-driven game, it's extremely boring. Um, so the coil gives us the the facility to almost kind of like design routes and design pacing um, in space. Um, so rather than just you know the, the quickest point for me to be is a straight line, we may be forcing the player into these kind of different scenarios, which again is is nice. But it also, much like when you design an FPS map, you need to design the routes through the coil as well. So. Yeah, that's, that's in, again, incredibly challenging because you've got third-party tools that really don't facilitate that, but we've got these tools in the engine that do facilitate that, and it's about marrying those things up together to make that possible. So the, the coil opened up this whole gas cloud tech, um, and as the coil is uh, like this large stormy nebula, we can actually use the same tech for other parts of the game. So whenever you want to enter a nebula, you can, we can use the same volume-based technology to fly through the different forms and uh, create really interesting different environments for the player to explore. So cooking is a process in Houdini for um, evaluating this large node graph that you make. Uh, it's a very procedural system, so in Fume Effects you generally simulate, so you calculate from one frame to the next frame what happens. In Houdini you can also uh, do simulations, but you can also procedurally generate from a source mesh all the different stages that you put on, on top of it. Uh, this allows you to go into one stage and change it and then make a small iteration there and have it all follow through. One, one thing that we concentrated on during the development of the coil was not just the volumetric aspect of the coil as, a, as an entity, but it was also visual targets for how it should, how it should look and feel at certain points in the coil. Um, and we did this really early on. As we were developing the volumetric tech, we also looked at, okay, well, how does a location inside the coil look? How does it look as you're approaching the coil? You know, what kind of things do we expect to happen as you fly into the coil? So that could be things like turbulence on the ship, for instance. It could be VFX. It could be like localized particles that start to ramp up as you get close to this, um, which is incidentally something we did do um, based on kind of, based on the density of the coil you get localized particles driven um, by game code. So there was a lot of work that went into these visual targets and that was separating scenes out and then saying, okay, well, for instance, the Starfarer wreck, which is something we saw in the live stream, we, we took that as a location and said, we, we know how the, like Nathan Dearsley went and he, he'd already made that video. Um, he'd, he'd kind of defined the look and feel of that area already. So we took that and said, okay, we we're taking this as a direction of how it should feel and look inside the coil and let's try and expand out of that as well. So we built tunnel routes down to it, you know, uh, we, we tried to fit like, how does it feel when you traverse it inside this thing? There was a lot of development that went into that. You know, some of it you see in the final version in the live stream. I, again, some of it was, was kind of throwaway. We, we didn't use it in the end, but it really defined what we wanted for this stuff. It, it's important not only to define the form and the volume of what the coil is, but how does it feel? How does it, how does it look at any point? Not just specific locations in the live stream, but also locations for the rest of the game as well. Like this is going to be a huge, a huge part of the game. So, and we've got a lot of content inside the coil. So defining how that looks and feels is important to us. Really late on in development, um, we're talking maybe a week or two before we went live, we had, a, we had a direction change on it. We, what we had made was looking pretty cool, but it didn't feel menacing enough. It didn't feel, it, it, felt, it felt too enjoyable for a player to be in that environment. Whereas everything, like I was describing before, 
this is supposed to be a hostile environment. It's supposed to be somewhere that you shouldn't really go to as a player. It wouldn't be where you'd choose to build your station, for instance. Um, so we, we had to change it and we had to make it look more in line with the law of it. And that, that was a colour change. Yes, we went from the kind of the kind of the ethereal blues to this kind of more menacing red kind of vibe to it, which I think just changed the mood and the, the feel of the entire of the entire uh, chapter or, or mission that takes place there. And that's why like a week or two before, I think actually, I think it was the Sunday before we were due to go live, I think on the Thursday, that's when we made the change. Um, and it was a case of kind of me and Caleb sitting on it on Sunday and kind of trying to come up with something. Monday morning we had a review with the directors, with CR. Uh, luckily they liked it. <laughs> so we were already um, starting to, you know, discover new uses for this technology. Uh, for example, like in Treo's scene in, in the demo, you, you're in this kind of debris field that's, that's sort of, you know, rotating around that, uh, that, around that planet. Um, Generally, it looked quite flat without any volumetric shading in it. Um, fog, obviously, everyone knows I'm a big fan of the fog. Um, so we've already started using, you know, can we use this technology to complement, for example, asteroid fields or, you know, rings around a planet? Um, we do have um, a type of shader that will do that, but it's very kind of cheap and suffers with kind of breaking at certain angles. Um, you'll notice it in the game. If you catch it at the wrong angle, it'll kind of look a little bit strange for a split second and then snap back. But with this, because it's fully volumetric and fully kind of, you know, shading correctly to the sun model um, that's there, um, it just looks 10 times better. And then you can fly into it, so you get that sense of full volumetric um, shading, um, which, is, which is really nice. You get that sense of depth, basically, that, that this, the other technique won't give you. Almost like location scouting, we call it. Um, similar to how development happens on a planet, actually, is that once you've once you've built this location, you know you've 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 built mountains, you've built rivers, you've built the sea. You know where all your kind of key locations are, and then you can go into that environment and say, okay, I want I want location A to be here on this mountain. I want location B to be down by the sea or something like that, and then you can work out a path between it. It's a similar kind of process here where we, we kind of build a section of the coil that just works and looks cool and visually is what art direction expects it to be. And this is where I go back to that flexibility as well because having that flexibility means that we'd have a little bit more control than that in the engine rather than just saying it would look cool from this location. Oh, but the pathway out of here doesn't really work well. We would then be able to create a pathway out there that worked well for us. Um, in terms of connecting these pockets together, that's going to be slightly different and that's a challenge that's going to come up in the next few months. We're going to have different locations in Squadron, um, different really cool locations, and they're going to be different pockets and we're going to have traversal routes between those locations as well. Um, and for me, the traversal routes are going to be something that I'm hoping uh, we can really play with. You know, how do those traversal routes work? Are they going to be really closed in environments like tunnels? We, we did do some, you may hear from some of the engineering guys, like when we started really early on in development, we did a lot of, rather than big open spaces with this volumetric technology, we did more confined closed spaces, so tunnel systems um, that connect together. You know, as a player, navigating these tunnels feels cool. So maybe we can look to bring some of that back in as well. And we've got, different mission specific locations in Squadron, connecting them with cool tunnels. Design would love that as well because it gives them an opportunity to get some flight of gameplay in there. Um, like the stuff that we made for the live stream, when you come out from Shubin to the, the outside of the coil, yeah, it felt cool, but you didn't really recognize it as being a volumetric entity until you quantum traveled away from it. Now, if we did travel into Khan's base or um, any other specific mission location, let's close those tunnels down and see how that feels, because that could be a really cool traversal. We're being really industry leading here. Um, like when you build a lot of conventional environments, there's a lot you can look back on. There's a lot of influence you can look back on. There's a lot of other games that have tend to have done the same things. You know, if we were looking at an FPS environment around, I go back to the pirate base on a planet, but you know, if we had a jungle around that base, then we might go back and look at some of the earlier crisis stuff. Or we might look at some of the more recent environments that are coming online to try and kind of uh, drive the workflow and practices that we have. But when it comes to building with this technology, because there's not really a great deal out there, 
it, we're defining that workflow, we're defining those practices. So there is a bit of trial and error in there. And that's the difference. You know, if I was going to make a texture for a rock, I'd know exactly what software to use. If I'm going to make a voxel for a volumetric system, well, there's, there's a few options in there. Some of them are better than others. And uh, that's what we've got to work out, really. Pretty interesting with all the stuff that we're doing and thinking about and working on in the future. Uh, and as you can see, the coil is an integral component to Squadron, uh, not just as an environment, but also as a character in its own right. If you want to stay on the front lines of Squadron 42's development, head to the game's webpage where you can enlist to receive monthly updates and never miss one of our Around the Verse Squadron specials. Yes. And don't forget to check out the RSI and Star Citizen sections of the website as well. The entire site has been redesigned and went live earlier today. And we can't wait to see what you guys think of the overhaul. We're pretty proud of it. We think it's pretty slick. Yes, it is. And to celebrate the new look and feel of the site, we have some new merchandise and packages available, including a slick mouse pad from Whitley's Guide, a new Star Citizen t-shirt, and the Loot and Scoot ship pack from Drake for all you aspiring pirates out there. Yeah, there's a few of those. Yes, there are. Also, remember you can still pick up Squadron 42 for just $15 until the end of the month with the Super Size Me promotion. Yeah, that's a pretty good deal for everything we got in Squadron 42. Uh, for even more on Squadron 42, uh, Tune in tomorrow at noon PST for a new episode of Reverse to Verse Live, where I, Chris Roberts, sit down with Community Content Manager Jared Huckabee to discuss the game further. And if you haven't seen it, check out last week's Reverse the Verse, where guest Jeff Zanelli answers questions from backers about penning Squadron 42's music. Yeah, Jeff has scored a ton of films and television shows like HBO's The Pacific and the latest Pirates of the Caribbean film. Uh, and it's a great interview for anyone interested in the cinematic scoring process and specifically the challenges of scoring games. Thanks to all of our subscribers for sponsoring our shows and allowing us to bring you these monthly updates and insights. Yes, definitely, thank you. And thank you, of course, to all the backers. Uh, you make it possible for us to make Star Citizen Squadron 42 the best damn games they can be. Yes, you do. And that's all for us from today. Yes, yeah, so until next week, we will we'll see, see you, you around, around the verse. Thank you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.